No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true 
praise cause there's nobody greater than you I'll praise, I'll praise cause you're sorry you praise cause you Church. Good morning. Happy Easter. Thank you to these young folks showing us some hand motions that you can do. Welcome to City Church. I'm Pastor John. I'm so glad you're spending your Easter Sunday with us. Wasn't that worship awesome? That was fantastic. I want to invite you on Wednesday night, we do a service called Revive. Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's an extended time of worship and prayer. If you like this, you're gonna like that. So be here on Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here. It is an awesome, awesome time. We continue to do a great services and I'm really excited about the teaching that's coming up next week. We're starting a series called Broken and Blessed. Broken and Blessed, it is going to be so, so good. It's Easter, so a lot of folks are gonna be here, y'all, okay? And so I'm gonna ask a favor of you. Are you guys gonna help me this morning? Are you guys gonna help me this morning? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna ask you to scoot in to make some room for the folks that are still arriving and that they can sit on the aisle and they don't have to climb over you and it's kind of weird. And as you're doing that, make sure you say hello to people, greet them with a holy high five, a holy handshake, or like a holy what's up if you're a cool guy. So, so.
Thank you, Lord. My soul cries out, yes. You've been so good, you've been so good. I thank you, Lord, I thank you. My heart is full, my heart is full. I love you, Lord, I love you. You've been so good, you've been so good.
He's getting closer. He's already on the move. Do you believe the church? Yeah, the story has been written. We all know how it is. Come on. My future has a name. My eyes are on my face. shouted Hosanna save us this week Lord you have done it you have saved us you are risen from the grave conquered death death has no sting this morning father we rejoice in this truth Lord we bless your name Savior King of Kings Lord of Lords we crown you in Jesus name we all said together amen. amen you may be seated
Well, happy Easter City Church. Uh, as you guys know, City Church as a movement, we're committed to mobilizing the next generation as leaders in Jesus' movement. And summer camp is a strategy, is part of our strategy to do that. And so I want to say to all my friends out there that are students in middle school or high school, I encourage you to sign up for camp this summer. Some of the most meaningful spiritual experiences I've ever had occurred at camps and retreats. And I think it can make a significant impact in your spiritual journey. Now, on this Easter, I think we can acknowledge there's been just some sad events going on in our country and in our world. And, uh, you know, Easter is supposed to be a time of joy and celebration. And so I wanted to start my time with you with some laughter. Are you okay with laughing on Easter? All right. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you an Easter joke. <laughs> so a man takes his wife and mother-in-law on a trip to the Holy Land. After an inspiring visit, sadly, his mother-in-law passes away. So the man gets together with the undertaker, and the undertaker tells him that it will cost $5,000 to ship his mother-in-law back to the States, or he could have her buried right there in the Holy Land for just $150. And the man thinks about it for a while, and he's like, nah, let's ship her back to the States. And the undertaker is a bit surprised. He's like, why would you pay $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law back to the States when you could bury her right here in the Holy Land for $150. He said, well, 2,000 years ago, another person was buried right here in the Holy Land. And three days later, he rose from the dead, and I can't risk that with her. God bless all the mother-in-laws out there, all right? <laughs> Easter, Easter is all about giving us hope, the kind of hope that can help us get through tough times in life. And this Easter, I want to give you hope. And, and I do want to clarify what I mean by hope, because sometimes people confuse hope with wishful thinking, and they're different. Wishful thinking is what happens when you don't think something's going to happen. In fact, you're, you're pretty sure it will not happen, but you just wish it would. You know what I mean? Like, I wish my parents hadn't split up. I wish my business hadn't gone under. I wish the Cowboys would win a Super Bowl one more time before I die. <laughs> you know, wishful thinking. <laughs> but hope is different. Hope is based on a legitimate reason to give us confidence that something will happen. It's like the San Antonio Spurs. Now, I've been following the Spurs ever since 1967 when they first came to San Antonio. My dad used to have season tickets back when they were $8 a piece. And we would go to lots of games, have a good old time. And I kept wishing they would win a championship. Year after year, decades go by, I just had wishful thinking. But then the Spurs drafted David Robinson. And then they drafted Tim Duncan. Yeah, baby. And my wishful thinking turned to hope because they gave me a reason to believe that something will happen. And, of course, the rest is history. Okay, so you got what hope is like. Hope is an expectation about tomorrow that inspires us today. Hope is a confident trust about the future that gives you strength in the present. And Jesus came to give us hope hope. And that is what Easter is all about, trusting in the one who can give us hope. And the kind of hope that Jesus offers us can give us the strength to get through trying circumstances in life. Do you have that kind of hope this Easter? Well, the gospel accounts tell us that on a Thursday night, Jesus gathered with his core disciples. They shared a meal together he gave them some final instructions as he was getting ready to pass on the leadership of his movement to the next generation. He also predicted that they would face some troubling times, some painful experiences together. But then he speaks these words of hope. This is John 16, 33. 
Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So here Jesus promises, guys, you're going to face troubles in this life. And and let me just clarify, Jesus never promised if you follow me, you'll never face troubles. In fact, he says the opposite. But he also promises that when you face troubles, you can have peace. If in me, if you are in me, you can have peace no matter what circumstances come your way. And you know what that tells me? That experiencing peace does not depend upon our circumstances. Experiencing peace depends upon a person, the person of Jesus, the one that can give you his kind of peace. And you're, you, you can experience that kind of peace when you're in him. Jesus also said, take heart. That means you can control your emotions, the way you feel about life. Even when you go through troubling times, because if you will take heart, if you will hold on to hope, That will give you the strength to get through what you're going through. And then he gives us the reason to have hope. He doesn't tell us to hope to take heart without a reason. He gives us the reason. He said the reason you can take heart and live with hope is because I have overcome the world. And that is what Easter is all about. We focus on how Jesus has overcome the world and what that means for us. Well, that same Thursday night... Jesus went into a garden to pray with his disciples. An angry mob shows up led by Jewish religious leaders. They arrest Jesus, and they take him back into the city to put him on trial. Now it's early Friday morning. They bring a bunch of of false accusations against Jesus. Then they sentence him to death, death on a cross. The one man in human history who deserved to wear a crown of gold instead dies wearing a crown of thorns. After hours of suffering, Jesus speaks his last words. This is Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, He breathed his last. Jesus dies hanging on a cross. And he told his disciples that he had to die to pay the ransom for the sins of all people, to pay for your sins, to pay for my sins. Can you see him there? Can you see him there hanging on the cross for you and for me? to the cross were you there when they nailed him to the cross oh sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they crucified my Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Ooh. 
to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Friday ends with some friends of Jesus burying his body in a tomb and rolling a large stone over it. The next day is Saturday. And most of the times, pastors don't talk about Saturday at Easter, but I'm gonna. Because I think there's some of you that may be living in Saturday today. To our knowledge, over the past 2,000 years, Saturday, that Saturday, was the only day when no one believes Jesus is alive. Saturday is the day between Friday's pain and Sunday's joy. It's the day between Friday's confusion and Sunday's clarity. It's the day between bad news and good news, darkness and light, death and life. And some of us know what it's like to live in a Saturday. After Friday's pain, after troubling times come, We cry out to God, God, hear me, help me, say something, do something, anything. But all we hear is silence. Your marriage is falling apart. You pray and pray, only silence. Your child is facing a challenging issue in life. You pray and pray, but only silence. You lose your job. You lose your wealth. You lose your health. Only silence. How will you respond to the Saturdays that will inevitably come your way? You can choose to respond with despair, responding to the silence of Saturday by just giving up. You could choose to respond with denial, turning to like a naive optimism to drown out the silence with positive affirmations. You could even choose disbelief, where you respond to the silence by just giving up on your faith and giving up on God. Or you can respond with hope. Hope is an expectation about tomorrow that inspires us today. Only when one event on that Saturday is recorded in the Christian scriptures. Those same Jewish religious leaders who had arrested Jesus and put him to death went to an official, a Roman official named Pilate, and they asked that they guard and secure Jesus' tomb because they remembered that Jesus had predicted not only his death, but that he would come back to life on the third day. And they wanted to make sure that his disciples did not come and steal his body and claim that he had been raised from the dead. This is Matthew 27, verse 65. Pilate answered, okay, Take a guard, go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. And please understand me, with a Roman guard securing that tomb, there were no people that were going to steal Jesus' body. On that Saturday... Those Jewish leaders thought they had ended Jesus' movement with this final act of abusive control. But after Saturday's silence, Sunday is coming. Before the sun, it was hope that rose over the horizon. That morning began with the sound of stone rubbing on stone, reminiscent of a rooftop being opened up by a lame man's friends almost three years prior. And just like that roof, light exploded into the room, 
Like the first day of creation when the word spoke lights bright enough to outshine any shadow of our sin. Light so strong and beautiful that it screamed across the universe at 671 million miles an hour, declaring the glory of God and his love for all touched by it. A scream deafened only by the actions of that same word just three days prior. His name was Yeshua. And his life brought the dawn of a new morning. It renewed creation so the Father would again see that we are very good. He carried every miscarriage to that hill to meet its death. So that which was barren would bear fruit once again. His body was violated and bruised for our abuse. And he held cancer in his hands to make sure that it was nailed to the cross for us forever. Every mental illness and emotional trauma that we felt, a thorn in the crown pressed into his skull. With unbroken legs, he overcame our paralysis. And when the sun refused to shine that day, he lifted his head towards heaven and taught us how to look through clouds thick as tar, heavy with depression, to look to the Father who loves us even when we think we're forsaken. Every miracle that he performed in his life was a scar of God's love that he bore in his body. And so on that morning, the birds sang praises to God. Yeshua, the glory of God, son of man, how great your love is. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. When the angel appeared to Mary, she was confused. She became overwhelmed and emotional. She starts to weep there near the tomb. And then suddenly Jesus appears to her. She doesn't know that it's him. She thinks it's the gardener. And she asks the gardener, where have you taken his body? Then Jesus speaks her name, Mary. And when he speaks her name, she turns and realizes it's Jesus. He has risen from the dead. He has overcome the world. He has even overcome death. And when she sees Jesus risen from the dead, it changes everything. Her tears of sorrow turn to tears of joy. And Mary Magdalene becomes the first person to witness the resurrection of Jesus. And I think it's so interesting that of all the people who got to be the first, it was her. And I think it is significant because we know enough about Mary's story to know that she faced some troubles in life. She had lived a messy life and made some messy decisions before she met Jesus. And I think Jesus choosing to appear to her first sends a message about who his movement is for. Jesus didn't come just for neat people with neat lives who never faced any trouble or never made any messy decisions. Jesus came for messy people who have all kinds of messy baggage. He came to give them hope and peace and salvation as only the Son of God could give. Well, after Mary sees Jesus risen from the dead, she runs to tell the other disciples, I've seen the Lord, I've seen him, he has risen from the dead. And Jesus' hand-picked core of leaders, these young leaders, refuse to believe her. They tell her, that all sounds like nonsense. Sunday morning now turns into Sunday evening. This is John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, 
when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them saying, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus once again speaks words of peace to them, his kind of peace. And then he shows them his hands and his side to confirm this really is Jesus. He has risen from the dead. Now they have become witnesses of his resurrection. Now their fear turns to faith. Now their sorrow turns to joy because now they believe in him. When you believe in Jesus, you become in Jesus. I'm going to say that again. When you believe in Jesus, you become in Jesus. And in him, you can have peace. But one of the disciples wasn't there. His name is Thomas. This is John 20, verse 24. Now, Thomas was not with the other disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Man, don't you just love this guy? <laughs> He's just so open about his skepticism. He says out loud what some people think and believe silently. And it's clear that the disciples have told him, no, 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 Thomas, we saw his hand. We saw the nail marks in his hand. We saw his sight. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And Thomas refuses to believe these eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. He says, unless I see it, I will not believe. And so Thomas, in that moment, chooses to stay in his doubt. And let me just say that that may be where some of you are today, if you could be honest. Maybe you're wrestling with doubts. Maybe you're wrestling with skepticism about Jesus. Thomas did. Uh, I just want you to know if that's where you are, you're welcome in this community of faith. We invite you to explore our faith and why we believe what we believe about Jesus. This is a safe community for you to do that. And one of the things I think that's so cool about Thomas and that Jesus picked a skeptic to be a part of his core disciples, I think he did that for a reason. He did that so that every skeptic throughout human history would have at least one disciple they could identify with. Finally, somebody who has skeptical thoughts like I do, and I'm one of them. But let me also say that at some point, you have to examine the evidence and look at the reasons why we believe Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, Thomas said, if I do not see, I will not believe. So one week later, so the next Sunday, the disciples are together again, only this time Thomas is with them. This is John 20, 27. Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. You see, Jesus had heard Thomas's words of doubt. Only instead of rejecting him, Jesus meets Thomas where he is. He shows himself to Thomas. He shows him his nail-scarred hands, his side where the sword pierced him. And when Thomas sees that it's the Lord, he believes. And then he speaks these words. He says, Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. And I think that's the word that Jesus is saying to some of you today. Stop doubting and believe. It's, the time is over for you to wrestle with these doubts. Look at the evidence and believe in me. And when Thomas sees Jesus risen from the dead and touches his body, he believes that he is God. The resurrection confirms who Jesus claimed to be, which is the son of the living God. Thomas is now in Jesus because when you believe in Jesus, you become in Jesus. And in Jesus, you can have peace. 
When Jesus appears to Thomas and gives him a reason to believe, he doesn't just stop there. He says one more word to Thomas, and it's clear that this word is not for Thomas. This is the word that Jesus speaks for you and for me. This is John 20, 29. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and still have believed in me. And this is what Jesus is saying to you and to me. He could see us. And he could see that some of us would wrestle with doubts just like Thomas. And, and, and would want to be able to touch Jesus' resurrected body and hear his resurrected voice just like Thomas. But Jesus could also see that there was only about 500 people who would get to witness his resurrection. And so these words he speaks to you and to me, who have not seen his resurrection, still believe in me. Based on the evidence of those who have seen me, still believe in me. And Jesus says this, when you believe in me, you are blessed. Blessed are you when you believe in me. Blessed are you when you believe in me. Blessed are you when you believe in me. And when you believe in him, you become in him, and in him you can have peace. And that kind of peace gives you hope no matter what circumstances you face in life. And maybe for some of you, you're, you're going through some troubling times even right now where you need some hope and some peace. Maybe it's a relationship that's a mess. Maybe it's a regret you can't get past. Maybe it's a hurt that just won't heal. Maybe it's a struggle with some kind of sin that has frustrated you. Maybe it's an addiction you can't shake. Maybe it's a financial challenge that weighs you down. City Church, the resurrection of Jesus means that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead can work in you in your life if you're in him. And that is what can give us peace and hope this Easter. And if you're not in Jesus yet because you haven't believed in him, I invite you to believe in Jesus today, this Easter. Because when you believe in Jesus, you become in Jesus. And in Jesus, you can have peace. Let's pray together. And I first want to pray uh, with those of you who are ready to believe in Jesus today. So I ask everybody, if you would close your eyes for a moment, I want to give everybody just uh, some space. If you're ready to believe in Jesus today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of faith. I'll lead you through it phrase by phrase. You just whisper it wherever you are. You ready? God, I believe in you. And I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sins. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I also believe he has risen from the dead so that he can give me eternal life. And I ask for eternal life because I believe in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then, Lord, I, I pray for those who just prayed that prayer with me. My prayer is that you would do what you promised. You promised that if we would believe in you, that we would become in you and that you would give us your peace. And so I pray peace. I pray peace for those who have prayed that prayer who have believed in you. I pray that you allow them to feel peace in their lives. And then, Lord, I want to pray for anyone going through a troubling time this, in this season. And so if you're facing a difficult challenge, trying circumstances, every eye closed, please. Just slip up your hand for a moment so I can see. I'm going to pray for you. I'm looking over here. Okay, I see you to my right. Okay, I see you. Okay, I'm, I see you here in the center. Okay, thank you. I'm looking over to my left. Okay, yeah, I see, your, I see your hands. Okay, I see your hands. You can put your hands down. Lord, you've seen those who have lifted their hands, acknowledging in your presence that they're going through troubling times right now. And so we ask you, Lord, as we look to you, the Prince of Peace, I ask that you would give them an inner strength, a peace in their lives that, that is beyond any understanding. Give them your peace as they go through this troubling season in their life. 
Give them the kind of peace, Lord, that will give them hope that they will get through what they're going through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. I want to invite you to stand now with us as we sing some songs celebrating our risen Savior.
Dash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. All together. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new. Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Our chains rent, faithfully more. Come on, and he cancelled my debt, and he called me his friend. When death walls are resting, and my life begins. Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Here we go. But then Jesus arose with our freedom. Yes, Lord, what a way to end the service today. And I want to tell you, if you heard Pastor Brent's message, and this is your first time believing, your next step is baptism. If you heard Pastor Brent's message and you want to be in Jesus, and you've never been baptized, your next step is baptism. So next week, we're doing a big baptism service on April 7th at all three services, 10, 11, 30, and 1, and we're going to live stream them so that your family, wherever they might be, will be able to see them. I encourage you to scan the QR code and sign up or go out to Connection Point and get signed up to get baptized. It is going to be awesome. Thank you for joining us today. He is risen. 
Now Jerome, take us on home.